Okay, welcome back. This is the last lecture of our course on stacks and moduli. And we'll, we get to the, the punchline of the entire course, which is we get to finish the proof of this theorem. Uh, and the remaining ingredient is, is projectivity. So that's today's goal. And uh, right, this is, I, I think of all the lectures I've given, I mean, I know I'm going fast and I'm not uh, always covering all of the details. This lecture sort of stands alone in that it is, you know, by far the most difficult and uh, it's more of a, yeah, more of a, some of the arguments are more at a, at a high level and I'll just try to convey the, the main idea. Uh, Right, and and uh, maybe the main references for this class, for this lecture are, are Kolar's paper on the projectivity of complete mod moduli, and that sort of builds fundamentally on ideas from Aviveg on uh, his on his book and quasi projective moduli for polarized varieties. And I think that I mean we're mostly following Kolar's paper here. And uh, yeah, so today's. You see on, yeah, on the screen, the, the outline for today, there's really, there's six sections. I'm gonna start with like a, a quick recap of how we got here. And, uh, and then I'm gonna go through sort of, sort of the setup for MG bar defining the line bundles that we'll try to show are ample. I'll survey various projectivity methods and try to show like how Kolar's method fits into the context of other arguments you might wanna give to get that MG bar is projective. And then at the then I'll sort of get to the core of Kolar's argument and where we're going to use NEF vector bundles. There, there's Kolar's key ampleness lemma, and then we'll apply it to, to MG bar. Yeah, that's that's the strategy. And so let me just let, let's start with sort of a recap of of uh, yeah how we got here. And so yeah, I, I've 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 mentioned this before, but this was sort of the you know, the philosophy that we're taking to construct MG bar as a projective variety is, is this six step process. And I'm formulating it as I did before and sort of a more general setup so that, because it's the same process that you might wanna to apply to construct any other projective moduli space. And so in our setting, we're interested in MG bar, right? And that we defined as, as, as a stack of stable curves of genus G. And we see, we, we see that it sits inside, you know, the stack of all curves. And so the first thing we did was show that the entire stack of all curves was algebraic. That was sort of step one of the six, six step process. The stack of all curves is algebraic. And the main idea, the way we showed this was we used a Hilbert scheme. Uh, to construct Smooth neighbor, a smooth neighborhood from some Hilbert scheme to the stack of all curves uh, uh, around any particular curve, around any curve, um, right? And once the you know the stack of all all cur curves is algebraic, you want then to deduce that the stack we're interested in, that is parameterizing stable curves. Uh, is also algebraic. And that follows from this openness statement that if you know that MG bar is an open substack, then since the, st the stack of all curves is algebraic, you get that MG bar is algebraic. And th this statement of, of openness of stability translates to the following, that if you have a family of curves, of arbitrary curves, you know, proper and flat, but the fibers could have uh, arbitrary singularities. Then what you need to, to know is that if that the if you look at the the all the points in in, uh, in S such that the fiber is stable, you need to show that this is an op open subscheme of the base. And the way we showed this was we broke this down into two steps. One, we showed that the nodal locus is open. And here we used a powerful result, although there are other methods. We used sort of the full local structure 
of nodes. And then once you know the nodal locus is open, you need to show the stable locus within the nodal locus is open. And here we had really, we had two different techniques. We sort of used that the main idea was that if C, C is stable, sort of is equivalently characterized by the automorphism group is finite, or you could use that the dualizing sheaf is ample. And either you can use that ampleness is open, uh, is an open condition in families, flat families, or that the automorphism group being finite is also an open condition by upper semi continuity and of, yeah, of the relative automorphism group schemes. But anyway, yeah, this, we, this, uh, yeah, this gives us the openness that was step two. And the next step is, so in this, and if we go back to this first step, you know, we, we showed not only that the stack is algebraic, but it's uh, locally a finite type. But it's definitely not of finite type, it's not quasi compact. And the boundness statement is then that the sub stack of stable curves is a finite type, it is quasi compact. And so we, to, to show this, we used that if C is a stable family, you have a stable family of curves. Then we had that the third tensor power is always very ample. And then if you combine this with the Hilbert scheme, uh, oh, therefore you can, you can use the Hilbert scheme inside, but uh, the third, the tricanonical embedding. And the fact is that this is, this is, this is a finite type. All right, so that gives us that. And so the, the, now we, after, after these first three steps, now at least we know that MG bar is a finite type algebraic stack. Uh, and then we can even get it to be Deline Mumford by using the criterion that it's, uh, that, that, uh, that the automorphism group is, is, is finite and discrete. So it's, we can even get it's, yeah, Deline Mumford. And then uh, applying the, the Kiel Mori theorem in step four. Because yeah, this is MG bar is Dalit Mumford. Uh, and uh, what yeah, this required we, we showed we had to show that MG bar is a separated DM stack. And then we and then apply and then you just apply the Kilmore theorem. Right, and uh, that, that, that theorem produces a course moduli space where we've now written it in uh, like with, without the calligraphic font, just a Roman font, this MG bar. And this is now, we know this separated algebraic space. So we're, yeah. And then uh, yeah, another key step, and this was one of the, in addition to the Kiyomori theorem, this was also one of the main theorems of the class was stable reduction, which we just showed in characteristic zero. Uh, the MG bar is proper. And that implies that the course moduli space is also proper. And like, and the way we showed this, just to remind you, is we verified the valuative criterion for properness. Uh, and we just did it in characteristic zero, and it, it required uh, using some results in the birational geometry and the minimal model program of services. And yeah, the final step, which is today, is projectivity. The MG bar is a projective scheme, a projective variety. And this is today. Uh, and like in step five, like birational geometry is gonna play a, a crucial role in, in, uh, yeah, in our argument. All right, and that sort of, yeah, that was sort of the goal of the course was to construct MG bar as a projective variety. Many other courses start with sort of assuming that as their input, and then, and then you, that's really where the fun starts, where you can start studying the, the geometry of this moduli space. Uh, but it's sort of nice to know, yeah, you know, I mean, the, the, the construction itself is sort of this remarkable and beautiful fact that in, in algebraic geometry and what got, got me interested sort of in moduli spaces to begin with. Um, I should also say, like, 
yeah, sometimes you can just work directly with the stack. You don't need to know that, the, that you have a projective course module as space. But, but often as you have many more tools at your disposal if you know that it's a projective variety, like you have sort of intersection theory and Hodge theory, the whole toolkit of, of projective geometry, birational geometry and whatnot. So like you can, you can yeah, knowing that it's projective allows you then to exploit those tools. Um, any, any questions? I'll take a, a pause for a moment. So when you say finite, uh, in the finite type step, when you say the Hilbert scheme is finite type, um, what do you mean? I, I'm used to maps being a finite type. Oh yeah, finite type over the, the base. So here I- Okay, I, I so over S? Yeah, well, I guess here, yeah, I wasn't it. You can, you can make this whole process work over spec Z if you want, or you can fix a, a ground field. So I just mean, yeah, over, over the base. Or yeah, yeah, right, over the base. Uh, and yeah, and because the Hilbert scheme is finite type, that sort of, that dominates in MG bar. Right? There's an, at least an open subscheme that, that surjects onto MG bar. So you get that MG bar is also finite type. Other questions? Even though we, I think we checked separatedness at the same time as properness, did we technically need to do it before step four to, Oh yeah, right. Like the, I debated internally with myself of what order. Step like step step four and step five, you can interchange them. I mean, certainly to verify the way the way I, I did it in my classes. I first did stable reduction. I just verified that mg bar. You know, I verified the existence part before the uniqueness part. So the last thing I did was separatedness. Um, but maybe it's better to, to first do separatedness. Yeah, you can do the separatedness first. Then get the course mod. Yeah, he had a choice of which order you, 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 you do these arguments in. Other other questions? Okay. So yeah, so let me quickly give you the sort of the setup for uh, for today and. Namely, like what I'm going to introduce some vector bundles and line bundles that we'll study. So we start with, uh, we take the universal family over NG bar. And then we're going to use that to define coherent, a coherent sheaf. So I take the, I could take the relative dualizing sheaf to, and I can take it to the kth power. And I could, that, that's a, uh, a, a line bundle on UG, on, on, the, on, the, on the total space of the universal family. In particular, it's a coherent sheaf. And we know that we can push forward coherent sheaves. And we get, uh, and uh, since it's a proper map, the push forward is also coherent. And so we get EK, and this is, yeah, this is a coherent sheaf on, on MG bar. And this is the first time we're really using sheaves on the Lee Mumford stacks in a fundamental way. I mean, we use the structure, the structure sheaf uh, in Kiyomori kind of, yeah, that, 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 that played an important role. But now, yeah, now we're using, yeah, much more of the theory of coherent sheaves on the Lee Mumford stacks. And to remind you, so you can, you can define this coherent sheaf this way, um, but, but a coherent sheaf, if, like the data of a coherent sheaf or a sheaf on MG bar is to every, you know, it's defining a sheaf in the big tau topology. So I need to say that for every morphism S to MG, you know, this, this then corresponds to a family of curves. The way I, I then get my sheaf on S, that is, this is then the, the pullback of EK is, is, is the push forward of the rel relative canonical of this, of this family. And therefore like the sections of this sheaf over S are the global sections of this sheaf. Right, so this is a this coherent sheaf, but using cohomology and base change, you can show that all of these are, are vector bundles. So, so far, so yeah, why are we doing this? We sort of just defined, by the way, uh, this EK was just temporary notation. I'm gonna, I'm, I'll, I'll be writing this out fully each time. Um, but yeah, why are, we, why are we considering this, this vector bundle? 
Well, for one reason, by, by taking determinants, we get line bundles. And we'll define these as lambda k, which is the determinant with the push forward Right, this, this is a line bundle uh, on, on MG bar. And yeah, that, that's sort of the starting point for projectivity because you need to show ampleness of line bundles. And just because, like, like as before, you know, this line bundle, you know, if I, if I restricted a homomorphism uh, corresponding to a family of curves, then as before, if I take if I just restrict to S, this then corresponds by properties of, of the dualizing sheaf and that is well behaved under pullback. This is then the determinant of the corresponding push forward. But not only do we have line bundles, this, this, this map has, there's more structure here that we get in interesting multiplication maps. So for a family of curves, I could also do this for the universal family, but for a family of curves, I could take, if I take the deep symmetric product of the push forward of the relative canonical, this maps to the push forward of the deep tensor power of the canonical. Right, and just this, yeah, this is sort of this map plays a very important role in uh, yeah in, in today's argument. Uh, and so let's just like spell out what this is concretely. Even when when C is say a curve over a field, right? Then this is the symmetric product. The push forward is just the global sections of the canonical sheaf, and it maps to global sections of the default product, right? And the kernel of this, the kernel of this map is identified with degree D equations defining the canonical, defining the curve in this canonical embedding, defining C embedded via the canonical. And so in particular, like, well, I guess if C is not hyperelliptic, hyper the, the point is that you can recover, yeah, you can recover C from the data of this map. And actually more generally, uh, here I was just studying the canonical, I, I can, given, given two integers, so given a, a K and a D, we, we have this map from sim D yeah this is this analogous multiplication map and like before, the kernel then cuts out uh, degree. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't be. Yeah, the kernel again is degree D equations now cutting out the pluricanonical embedding into some projective space. Uh, yeah, where, yeah, this is. Right, and, and now if you take K to be at least three, we know now that this that these are closed embeddings. And so that, that you can recover, the point is that you can recover C from the multiplication map. So this gives a way of encoding sort of the data of C via its equations. All right. Any, any questions? So yeah, I'm going to try to give a survey now of different projectivity methods. Uh, right, I'm going to sort like survey they, like the 
quickly, uh, quickly survey the GIT approach, maybe the Hodge theoretic approach, and then I'll get to sort of uh, projectivity via positivity of line bundles leading to Kolar's approach. Uh, but it's important to, to go through this anyway, because there's, these, there's many arguments here for projectivity. And, and, and when you get into more of the de details, you can combine ideas from different approaches. And, you know, and when you, yeah, like there's a lot of parallels between GIT's approach and uh, Kolar's approach. You know, it's, yeah. And yeah, and so, yeah, for the, the first approach is geometric invariant theory, GIT. And the construction is going to depend on two integers, K and D. So the two integers we saw before, and there, these are also the integers that are going to come up in Kolar's construction. So given K is going to be the integer that we use, uh, we, that we take the, a multiple of the canonical to embed our curve, right? So if we take a stable curve, we can embed it via the kth power of, of, of the dualizing sheaf, as we were doing before. And we embed into projective space. And I'm just going to use the, this R of K is just H0 of the dualizing sheaf. And by Riemann Rock, when K is not 1, this is just 2K minus 1 times G minus 1. Right, and, uh, and then you can also compute explicitly if you want the Hilbert polynomial of this using Riemann rock, but let's just let that be P of T. And the, so the whole idea in GIT is that uh, like it's easier to sort of study embedded curves rather than abstract curves. And so you consider sort of the, uh, the Hilbert scheme, uh, you sort of the, consider the Hilbert scheme of all subschemes with that Hilbert polynomial, but then you wanna look at specifically Sort of the, the 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 curves that are embedded that are the stable curves that are embedded via the kth canonical embedding, right? And this is a locally closed subscheme, uh, and right. And then H, uh, and then we and then we let H be the closure of H prime, right? Because H prime is just quasi projective. If you take eight, the, if you take this closure, you get a projective variety. All right. And now here is the important, the important map uh, is that I can, I can embed H, this sub, the closed subscheme of the Hilbert scheme into a Grassmannian where if I'm given a curve, uh, right, if I'm given a curve inside projective space, I, I, I just, I, I look at, uh, so this, this is the, the Grassmannian. Uh, this is the Grassmannian of. Let, let me write this P D dimensional quotients of uh, the, uh, of this vector space. All right, and if I have a if I uh, oh, if I have a curve here, then I, I get a quotient just by taking this surjection. I take uh, this surjection from O of D on projective space to O of D on the curve, right? And when D is large enough, this is, this is, a, this is a surjection. So this is a bona fide element of the Grassmannian. And this is, yeah, and actually we can identify this, uh, right? This is exactly sim D of H zero omega C tensor K. And this is H zero of omega c tensor dk. So that, in other words, yeah, this, this is the multiplication map. So this embedding of h into the Grassmannian associates you know, a curve in projective space to its multiplication map. Right, and, and moreover, yeah, this, you know, you know, the Grassmannian we know is projective. This also embeds into, you know, the Plucker via the Plucker embedding into the pro projectivization of the PD determinant of this vector space. So, so and you can pull back O of one here and you get, uh, you get a line bundle, an ample line bundle on the Grassmannian and then therefore an ample line bundle uh, on H. So let's call that LD. 
And moreover, you also have uh, you also have an action of PGL R of K minus one acting on this space uh, such that H is equivariant with respect to this action. Um, great. It's worth mentioning, I, I know like the Hilbert scheme has been used in fundamental ways in, in this course, uh, but we, we've never, and, and uh, and, and if you're interested in knowing the details of how it's constructed, it's essentially, you know, this is, this is the way you prove that the Hilbert scheme is projective. You embed it and be it's Grassmannian. And what you need to show, and this is the difficult part, is, is exactly that this, this sort of uh, regularity that when, when D is sufficiently large, that this is actually an embedding. So here we're just, yeah, here we're using that. Okay, so this, that's the basic setup for GIT. And so what's easy to show, uh, so I, up in the top of right, I just recalled sort of the notation because it's, yeah, there's a lot of symbols here just so that you can remember what lambda k is. Right, so what's, what's, what's easy to show, essentially we showed this for mg in fact, but it's easy to show that mg bar is the uh, quotient stack of h prime mod this group pgl uh, R of K minus one. All right, this just comes from the, the fact that to give it because we're uh, we're taking C to be stable and we're taking it embedded via the kth canonical, uh, the the that the choice of embedding C into this projective space is just a choice of a basis of of the kth canonical and and the, this PGL is precisely modding out by that choice of basis. Okay, what's hard to show. This is the whole part of, of, of GIT. It's hard to show that, say, given a point H corresponding to a curve in, uh, in this projective variety H, closed subscheme of the Hilbert scheme, what's difficult to show is that C being stable is equivalent to H and here being GIT stable with respect to this line bundle we just defined LD. All right, this line bundle LD, well, yeah, it was this one over here. All right, and here on the left-hand side, this is stability as a curve. And here, this is stability with respect to GIT, and that means sort of that there exists a section S uh, on H of, of L of D to some power maybe, non-zero power, uh, but that's invariant with respect to the, the PGL such that the section doesn't vanish at H. Uh, constructing sections on the Hilbert scheme is like almost an impossible task so that you can almost never verify that uh, on a Hilbert scheme. But the, the beauty of GIT is that there's, there's a Hilbert Mumford criterion, which you can check in practice and the Hilbert Mumford criterion produces sections. So an, uh, yeah, another way to think about this, this uh, what, what, the def, what, what the definition of a stable or semi-stable point in GIT is, is that it's precisely, you know, we have, you have, we have this quotient stack H, I'll just, I'll write it down at the bottom. We have this quotient stack H mod PGL uh, uh, R of K, and we have a line bundle on it, LD, and the semi-stable locus is precisely like where this line bundle, the, the maximal open where this line bundle is semi-ample or where some sufficiently high power is base point free. Like, the, or in other words, like the complement of the semi-stable locus is the stable base locus for this line bundle. Anyway, let me erase this. Yes. Okay, but yeah, but so this, this is a hard point in uh, 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 verifying the Hilbert Marfer criterion. But let me just tell you the conclusion is that once you show this, what you get is uh, the coarse moduli space. 
of mg bar is then the proj of sections of this line bundle. And note that this is what I was trying to say earlier, I guess, was that sections here of, of this are identified with global sections on the quotient stack, H mod PGL, R, K, uh, L, D, to the nth power. Oh, yeah, here I used O of H of N. That I should, let me just write, this is, should be L, D, yeah, same thing. Right, and, and in particular, right, and part of, yeah, and part of what GIT says is that this, this entire ring is finitely generated and, and you get that, yeah, MG bar is projective. All right. But what makes this work, I'll just emphasize again, is that you can you can reduce, you can actually check the Hilbert Mumford criterion in some cases, and that's what allows you to get sections. And like and and you know, ampleness of a line bundle is all about having enough, enough, yeah, enough sections with certain properties. And the way this works in practice is actually difficult to show this this hard fact that C is being stable is equivalent to GIT stable in complete general generality. What you usually do is you just show it for smooth curves and then you try to exploit that stability to get it for, for everything by sometimes ad hoc methods or. Right, and actually what the GIT argument gives you more is that, uh, let me just sort of summarize again. Again, we have the just basic setup to remind you in the top left. Uh, what we get is that if you do this, this, this GIT construction for any K larger than five and D sufficiently large, you can just compute the class of the ample line bundle you get on MG bar and it has this form. You know, it's sort of defined in terms of these lambdas uh, that we get. Uh, and if you take D to be sufficiently large, the asymptotic limit uh, is proportional to this number here. So this is just, I've just scaled things to make delta, the constant in front of delta to be one. So this means proportional. Uh, and this is the boundary divisor. And, but yeah, so this actually gives you quite a lot. So this, this is sort of tracing out part of the ample cone on MG bar in like the lambda delta plane. But you can you can actually get more, which is this theorem by Konaba Harris, is that in fact a lambda minus delta is ample if and only if a is greater than one. And what GIT gave with k equals five only gives eleven point two. <laughs> so you can work a little harder and you get the, the full ample cone, um, at least in that in that two dimensional plane of the Picard group. And the idea of this Kodama Harris, which is similar to many ideas of for, for to, to get ampleness is, is sort of, it, it uses GIT in a fundamental, fundamental way to get some positivity and then it, it bootstraps and exploits that. Yeah, and, and yeah. Great, okay, so that was one method, GIT. There's another method, which I'll just say, I'll say very little on because I'm not really an expert in is that you can use, you can get projectivity sometimes by, you know, period maps and Hodge theory, where the main idea, where the main idea is you can, you can associate to a smooth curve, it's polarized Jacobian, right? Here, this is the sections of the canonical. This is as a complex vector space, this has dimension G, and then you mod out by this lattice that's, this, this is dimension over Z, it's 2G. So it's a 2G two, two dimensional lattice inside G and it's 
naturally polarized if you choose a symplectic basis. Um, and you know, or you know, alternatively, you can you can consider sort of the map from C to some some sort of the, to, to sort of the hot structure. You can look in inside uh, maybe you can look at H one of C omega C inside the uh, the cohomology, which is the point is that this is sort of constant. This is always g dimensional and as you sort of uh, yeah vary your curve, you you're getting uh, different different lines um, inside projected inside this yeah inside this vector space. As so you get a yeah po like a polarized Hodge structure, and then so this gives you a map from like from mg or mg bar to some other space parametrizing polarized Jacobians or polarized hot structures, depending on how you phrase things. And uh, and then the idea is that, yeah, so you get this map and this is a particularly nice space for, for curves. This is the, the, sort of the Siegel upper half plane mod, the uh, symmetric group, sorry, symplectic group. And then the whole, the strategy is to show predict, you first should show projectivity of the right-hand side. And then by, if you understand that map and can show that, yeah, sort of the Torelli theorem you can infer projectivity of mg bar. Okay. I won't say much here, other than I'll also sort of just highlight that that the this, the, the push forward of the relative canonical uh, plays a role here. Uh, of c over s plays a role. I mean, as, as does the, whoops. Yeah, as, as does this sheaf via Hodge theory. Yeah. Okay. Any, any questions? Any questions on, on that? So the second approach, does it only work over C or can you somehow bootstrap it to work over say Z? I think uh, I think that's a good question. So yeah, the question was, can you make this work in positive or mixed characteristic? And uh, yeah, I, not yeah, I, I view this as working over C. Uh, I think you can get the Teichmuller. No, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I think this is uh, this is a very. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe there is. I, I'm not aware of one. I view this as a complex analytic approach. So, I mean, it's not strictly speaking the uh, Siegel upper half plane, is it? Uh, when it's mg bar, and we're getting yeah, some perspective, yeah, right, it's, right, it's including right. the real line or something. Yeah, let me not the real line, but <laughs> move the bar. Yeah, yeah. Compactifying that map is is yeah is an issue, and you have to address that. And I'm yeah, I really can't say much more here. All right, so let's let's let, let's get to projectivity via sort of positivity of line bundles. So our third approach, uh, and this is so yeah. The, the idea here is that we 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 already have mg bar as a as a as a proper Deline Mumford stack, and and therefore we have a proper algebraic space as its as its coarse moduli space. We have these line bundles lambda k that defined are defined on the stack, but you can show that they they descend. This is this fact here that sufficiently high multiples descend to the coarse moduli space. And then the goal then is to show that these line bundles are ample on the coarse space. And so there's various techniques to show ampleness in algebraic geometry. And uh, yeah, there's a sort of a plethora of techniques. So maybe, um, maybe one of the simplest to, to see that actually works is is the following. Like, let's suppose that, uh, so let's suppose that you know that uh, the line bundle is semi ample. That means some multiple, some high multiple is base point free. I mean, yeah. Uh, 
And suppose you also know that for every proper curve, that the degree of the line bundle is, is positive. Then the conclusion is that this line bundle is ample. And the reason this is true is, that is, is quite straightforward, is that you have mg bar, and I could just consider sort of the map to the, uh, to the projectivization or to the, whoops. I can consider that the, the, the map to the project to, to, uh, that you get by, by taking sections of lambda k to the n. And what A tells me here, A implies that this map is well-defined, right? It precisely says that this line bundle, that, yeah, that, that there's enough sections to separate points. So you have an honest morphism of schemes or of stacks, yeah. And B tells me that this map doesn't contract curves. Right, if it contracted a curve, the degree of the line bundle on that curve would be zero, but we're requiring that it's strictly positive. And therefore, you know, we also have a coarse moduli space. This is, and by the universal property of coarse moduli spaces, you get a map to X and, uh, Right, and this map also doesn't contract curves. So it's quasi finite. But, but both mg bar, you know, we know that already that this is proper and we know that, you know, x is proper. So this is quasi finite and proper. So we get that it's finite. And that from that you, did, from that you, you deduce that mg bar was projective. Right, anything finite over something projective is projective. Ampleness is, you can, yeah. Right, yeah, and yeah. And a line bundle is ample if and only if it's ample on, uh, after the pullback under a finite map, right? And here the pullback of, of the O of one on X is lambda K. So we get that lambda K is ample. Unfortunately, the semi-ampleness semi condition is is really, this is tough to check. I mean, this is sort of like the, in the, in, in the condition of, of uh, stability in GIT, you need to show that there's enough sections, invariant sections to separate points. And there you had the Hilbert Mumford criterion, but in general, semi-ampleness, yeah, it, it's hard. But there's sort of, in, in birational geometry, there's, there's various base point freeness theorems that can sometimes imply semi-ampleness. And there's sort of like, there's various statements depending like that you might want to use depending on your technical hypothesis. But maybe one example of, of something that works or that can be made to work, we won't use this, but if you, if you know that you're big, uh, that you're an F and that the section ring is finitely generated then these three conditions can imply semi-ample. And, but this then, yeah, that, but that this is sort of hard to, yeah, these properties are also sort of hard to show. Uh, sometimes you can get this, sometimes if you wanna apply BCHM, uh, sometimes you can, get, you can get finite generation. I mean, usually you need to already know something is projected to start with, but, uh, and of course, yeah, this is sort of related to sort of various conjectures of birational geometry, like the abundance conjecture. And, um, but yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it can be tough to use. And then at the bottom here, I've, I've sort of sketched out other criterion that we, that we, we have. Uh, these are other tools to, to show ampleness. And, uh, that may, yeah, maybe you've seen before, but yeah, sort of just summarized here that, you know, that uh, there's the Nakai Moshizan criterion, which says that if X is a proper algebraic space and L is a line bundle, then it's ample if and only if sort of that, that if you take irreducible clo closed sub varieties of arbitrary dimension, then that you get a positive intersection. Yeah, and this is actually the criterion that will, that will come up in, in Kolar's method. 
But it's, it's important to keep all of these in mind. Uh, there's also Kleinman's criterion, which says L is ample, if and only if you, when you intersect it with something. This is in the closure of the, the cone of curves. This is the closure. And then for anything in the closure of the cone of, in the cone of curves, then, then you have to, this is positive. It's, it's actually, it's often not hard to show that for an honest curve that you have strictly positive intersection, but going to, it, like going to the limit is, is, this is really hard to check in practice. And similarly, like the Shadri's criterion is an ampleness where you just need to check on curves, but here you, you need to check that, that not only is it strictly positive, but that you can sort of, that you get sort of, that you can control how positive it is, that it's greater than epsilon, some given epsilon times uh, like, the, like the multiplicity of the singul singularities of that curve. Um, this can also be, yeah, tough to check. And I view all of these criterions, basically everything on this slide as sort of a, yeah, as something, as a, a, a criterion that may or may not work depending on your like technical hypotheses. And I think it's just sort of the Nakai Moishizan criterion it just was, was the criterion that Kohler was able to use in his ampleness criterion. Um, all right, so now we're gonna move on to, 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 to Kohler's method but I'll stop for questions. It, what does BCMM stand for? Oh, it's, that's Burkar, Keshkini, Haken, and McKernan. It's like one of the, there's a paper oh. from about 10 years ago that they, they proved that the, uh, that the canonical, the, the section ring of, of the canonical divisor is always finitely generated, which is, yeah, it was one of the most spectacular results in algebraic geometry like this century. Okay, thank you. Can I ask, you said that the like really tough step here is checking like semi ampleness. And then like in contrast with the setup with the Hilbert scheme, it seemed like we had a line bundle that already was ample. But the hard step was checking that there were enough sections that were actually invariant. So it's like now though we're looking just for sections and they don't necessarily have to be invariant. Or is it like now that I'm working on this stack, like they already sort of are the invariant ones in disguise? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I think that's, but I think if you, if you think about it more at the stack level, then it's just constructing sections that don't vanish at any point. Uh, Right. Okay, and then like that translates to on the Hilbert scheme, in order for that to make sense, we want invariant things. Right, right, yeah. That, that's that, so. I guess there's two parts to the the, the the story. Is that sections? I guess that's written sloppily over here. Is that sections on this quotient stack are um, the same as equivariant sections on the Hilbert scheme? But to connect this to the semi ampleness is that like what, what this what what we what we need to show uh, is oh I don't know where to write it is that is it, yeah is that uh, okay where should I write this uh, I'll write it up here okay we have mg bar sitting inside this quotient stack h mod pgl and here we have a line bundle ld what we need to show is that ld restricted to mg bar is semi ample. That's another, wo another way to, to phrase um, that, uh, yeah, the mg bar is the semi stable locus of this line bundle. Does, does that help? I think so. Wait, and back on the, on the left hand half of this page, you wrote like LD for it, like basically the pullback of that to H, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Right, right. LD was defined as, yeah, you're right. As like, you have this, like, like this uh, line bundle on the Grassmannian coming from the Plucker embedding. You pull that back, uh, you get a line bundle LD on the Hilbert scheme, but everything is equivariant with respect to this group PGL. So you also have an action of this group on the line bundle. And that's what tells you that the line bundle actually, you know, descends to that quotient stack. Right. 
And then you have this line bundle on this quotient stack. And yeah, just to repeat, the main challenge is again, is the semi ampleness of this line bundle restricted to the to MG bar. All right, thank you. No problem. I think we were here. Okay, then we're going to move on to our our next topic, which is uh, nephness. Oh, I think I called this three. This maybe should be four. Sorry. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Nephness, and we need to. So that you might be familiar with what nephness is for for line bundles, but here we're going to use the vector bu vector bundle analog, and we say that a vector bundle E on a scheme is neph uh, or semi-positive. Both terminologies are used. Kolar uses semi-positive. Uh, okay, is neph if and only if the definition is that for all proper curves and for all line bundle quotients that the degree of L is greater than or equal to zero. So in other words, yeah, a vector bundle is neph if you if you pull it back to any curve, then any line bundle quotient has positive, has non-negative degree. And this is, this is a nice notion. That, I mean, and there's various equivalent ways to state it. Maybe one way to relate it to just ordinary nephness is that you can take, uh, if you take the projectivization of this vector bundle, this is some scheme over X, and there's an O of one, and you want this to be, uh, to be neph on P of E. So, and there's, this is sort of similar to how you define ampleness for vector bundles. On schemes. So, yeah. So I'll, I'm going to use, yeah, I'll, I'll use ne the NEF terminology rather than semi positive. Only because it's just simpler. It's only three letters, so it's easier to write. <laughs> and the NEFness has some nice properties. Maybe the ones maybe to highlight is that it's sort of ne NEFness is closed under taking quotients and extensions. Uh, it's also open in flat families. That's a desirable property. And another thing that we're going to use is sort of if E is NEF, then certain tensor products, and in particular, uh, the, the sym symmetric product is NEF. And maybe why you might care about this, th this third property is, is that we actually have, you know, remember we have this multiplication map. Uh, for a, a family. And so if you can show that this map is, in some cases, this map will be surjective. In fact, if you're, th if you're not parameterizing hyperelliptic curves, then it's a theorem by Max Noether that a non-hyperelliptic curve is, is sort of um, projectively normal and it's canonical embedding, which translates to sort of that, that, all, that all pluricanonical sections are generated by sections of the canonical. In other words, this map is surjective. And therefore, like this, you can kind of infer in that, Maybe I should say if this isn't always true, but if you can arrange this to be true, then this is that then this net implies that this is net. Okay, so here is uh, okay. So now we're getting to sort of the content of, of Kolar's approach. Uh, so the first theorem is that here's what we need to check in order to get the mg bar is projective. So suppose we know that uh, mg bar is a proper delene Mumford stack. Actually, here, yeah, this we already know. And now, and, and suppose you, you also know that uh, that's sufficient for sufficiently large k, uh, and for and for any stable family. But let's let's take a stable stable family over a smooth projective curve T. That this what you need to show is that this push forward is nef for sufficiently large k. So this, if you get that these, these push forwards, which are yeah, these vector bundles, if you get nephness of the vector bundles, then Kolar tells you their determinants are ample, again, for k sufficiently large. So I have sort of have two goals now. One is to explain 
maybe why theorem one is true, uh, or at least hint at yeah some of the, the intuition behind it, and then uh, and then at the end sort of turn to how how you verify this condition. Um, but before do, but yeah, before going further, let me just make a couple of remarks here. And that you know, Kolar's original motivation, as was Vivek's at the time, was not to construct MG bar. That was already known. There were various methods already. They, they were interested in sort of constructing moduli of, uh, of surfaces or of higher dimensional varieties. And this this technique, uh, this theorem one, does work. Generalizes to, to the moduli of polarized. To really any moduli of polarized varieties, you just need to check that analogous condition for for uh, nefness of of, of uh, these vector bundles. And in fact, this is the method. I mean, Kolar's method has is only becoming more relevant with time. So, like, just to highlight some recent results, is that a recent paper by Kovacs and Patak Falvi showed that uses the same method to show that the moduli of stable varieties in any dimension is projective. And then even more recently. Is the analogous result for, for K stable? Um, oh, I should add Fano's here. So, in the, in the sort of the opposite of the general type situation, mo modulo of K polystable Fano's is projective. Um, so, yeah, that's my first remark is that I, I'm sort of specializing this whole discussion to just MG bar because that's what, yeah, I'm interested in this course. But uh, the techniques I'm, uh, I'll be mentioning soon are. Yeah, are, are relevant in yeah for, for any moduli of polarized varieties. Um, and 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 so my second remark here is that we don't just need that the push forward of the dualizing is neph. We need that the push forwards of powers of the dualizing are neph for all k sufficiently large. And in fact, for mg bar, the push forwardness of just this the the dualizing sheaf is sort of an easier and it's and it's a classical fact. I mean, I think there's a long history, um, you know, going back to Fujita, Karamata, on this. Sometimes, yeah, involving analytic techniques. I mean, Kolar even has an earlier paper where he, um, yeah, where he shows this is uh, where he, he his goal was to show that MG bar was yeah where he can conclude that MG bar is projective by uh, you know constructing certain metrics. On this vector bundle, uh, and yeah, uh, right. But on the other hand, yeah. So while nefness for the the push forward is 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 easier, um, actually for mg bar, I think maybe you need characteristic if, in characteristic zero. This is actually enough to construct uh, to construct it by some ad, ad hoc methods. But I think in, in the higher dimensional setting, you really need the nefness of, of all the high push forwards of the, 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 the powers of the dualizing sheaf. Um, yeah, and it's actually, it's, it's harder to show the nefness of this, of, the, of, of these guys, despite the fact that, that, despite that they are actually more positive. You know, so yeah, as I've been emphasizing, there's many techniques you might want to take for projectivity. You know, you could go the route of just showing nefness for the, the for the first uh, push forward, where there's analytic arguments that show it more directly. Um, but then I'm, I'm taking sort of this less ad hoc approach by just yeah, I want to verify Kolar's criterions. Any questions? How does the um, in theorem one? How does the the size of k relate to k zero? Is it? Oh, uh, oh. I think the point is that you just need to know. You need to sort of, uh, yeah. You need to know that there exists some constant so that such that for k bigger than that constant, you get nefness for all families of stable curves. Oh, it, oh. And then maybe you were asking about this conclusion here. Uh, I don't know whether you can get an explicit bound on that K of whether you can actually get 
Yeah, that's a good question. If whether if you can control the k you need in terms of some function of k naught, I, I don't know. Yeah, that was it. Thanks. Is the definition of a stable variety uh, standard in the high dimension? I, the, the, uh, there is a mm, yeah. The, I think the, yeah. <laughs> there is a notion of a stable family in higher dimensions, and this is the, the yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, the notion of what a stable family is 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 trickier, but there are our definitions of that that work. But it's sort of a, yeah, an entirely other, other subject when one gets into um, really yeah, like singularity theory. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm not going to try this to define what a what a stable variety is. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we're going to get get into the the heart of this of uh, of this talk now. So this is the ampleness lemma. This is Kohler, yeah, the, one of the key steps of this argument. And I'm gonna set it up as follows. So we take a, a proper algebraic space, and then we take a vector bundle, W, of rank little w, and we're gonna assume that it has a, a structure group, you know, uh, G, which we're assuming is reductive to sitting inside GLW. What this means is that, you know, W is a vector bundle, that means you know, it's defined locally by these transition functions that are just art like that could be arbitrary w by w matrices. But to say that it has structure group is to say that actually this transition matrices live in a, a smaller, uh, you know, algebraic subgroup of GL. Okay. And then the third piece of the data is that we have a quotient bundle of rank little q. And given you know, these three things, we get this interesting map, the classifying map that takes uh, a point, you can define this functorially if you want, but let me just say it on points. So I, I take a point X to, I just take the, the, the quotient of the fibers. Oops, to QX. Um, you know, this, yeah. But I, I in order to, to this to be an element of the Grassmannian, I need to choose, choose bases. So I, if I choose a basis here, this is uh, K of Q, sorry, W, this is K of Q. And uh, the point is that um, because the structure group of the vector bundle is G, uh, the choice of bases uh, only depends up to, up to G. So I, this is well-defined up to G. So the, the point is like yeah, that that if 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 I if I if I removed G from this map, that it would not be well defined. That's why I'm mapping to the quotient stack mod G. All right. And yeah, and so here's the ampleness lemma, and yeah, yeah, I'm only stating it in characteristic zero, but there is there is a positive characteristic version. It's just slightly more more complicated to write. So if in addition we know that W is Neff, and you know that this map is quasi-finite, then you get that the, the, the determinant of Q is ample. This is sort of remarkable. I mean, yeah, this is really cool. This sort of, you're mapping to the Grassmannian, not quite the Grassmannian, this quotient stack by the Grassmannian. And the idea is you're using sort of positivity of the Grassmannian to sort of, for positivity on X, uh, but, let me make some, some sort of remarks on this. Uh, first is, let me just say what the easy case is. Let's suppose W is trivial. You know, that, that means that the structure group is, is also trivial. G is trivial. And that, yeah, and what that means that I actually, is that I actually get a map from X to the Grassmannian. 
And uh, note that both of these are proper. Therefore, this map is also proper. But we're, we're assuming that it's also quasi-finite. So that implies that the map is, is also finite. Um, and that implies that X is, is projective. And moreover, that you know which you know what line bundle example is the de determinant of Q. As that as that Q is, yeah, corresponds to the linearization on the Grassmannian. So yeah, so of course W is not always trivial, but you sort of balancing out the non-trivialness of W with the semi-positivity of W. That's sort of the magic of this of this argument. And note we are not assuming anything about the stability of the image. We are not assuming that the image of X lands in the stable locus, in the G stable locus. But if it did, you would actually get more. And in, in fact, if it did, then this argument would be the yeah, it wouldn't it, it would be, it would be easy to prove. Because um, if it did, you know, then you would have a map from X certainly to the uh, it would have a map to the stable locus, even the semi-stable locus. Sorry, yeah, st st semi-stable locus, and therefore it maps to the projective GIT quotient. And because it actually lands to the stable locus, we know that this map is, is quasi-finite. But again, like everything, you know, X is proper, this is proper, so you get that this is quasi-finite and proper, so you get that this map is finite and you get that X is projective again. And in fact, in this case, you get projectivity. And if you if you work out what the what the what the what the class of the line bundle here is, uh, you actually get more ampleness. You get that. You actually get that not just the determinant of Q example, but if I raise this to the W and tensor with the determinant W to the negative Q, you get that this a stronger a stronger ampleness condition. Okay. And uh, the one thing I, yeah, I'm not really going to cover today is. I'm not going to say much about the proof of the ampleness lemma, but the main idea of the proof of the ampleness lemma um, is to use nefness to to show that to verify the to verify Nakai. Moises on. Sorry for my handwriting. Oh. Namely, you need to show that you're right. That this was the condition that you know for all subscheme Z of uh, in this case, yeah, X. You need just to know that the line bundle uh, determinant of Q uh, to the dimension of Z intersected with Z is positive. So if you could somehow compute this number in terms of like uh, in terms of the vector bundle W, you can use the nefness of W to, to get at some positivity. But yeah, there are quite a few details there that I'm not, not going to get into. What I would like to explain is how we use the ampleness lemma. But I'll pause, I'll pause for questions. Okay, so yeah, so we have, uh, so yeah, well, I'm gonna to turn to the, the, the final section of this talk, which is how we apply this to get projectivity of MG bar, okay? So on the left-hand side, I'm just reminding you of, of what we had. We had the ampleness lemma, 
which I just reformulated here. And then we had this theorem one, which was uh, what we need to verify to get ampleness of lambda k. And so what I'd like to explain is how we use the ampleness lemma to prove theorem one. So here's a, a sketch of the proof of theorem one where we're, we're going to use the ampleness lemma. We, we start with uh, we start with the universal curve and I'm just calling now C to be the universal total family of the universal curve and S to be the base. And so this, this, is, this argument is actually not that bad. What we, what we do is we choose K and D, these integers, uh, such that, you know, such that one, we need that the relative dualizing sheaf to the kth power is relatively very ample. Actually, here we know that k equals three suffices. We need to know that, yeah, I say that, I say that the higher push forwards are, are zero. And we can arrange that uh, every curve, C embedded via this kth canonical into some projective space is actually defined is cut out. Set theoretic is enough, but you can even, yeah, it's cut out by degree less than or equal to D equations. So the ideal sheaf is, is yeah, the, uh, is generated uh, in degree D. And you, we, we also, uh, yeah, we know from the hypothesis of this theorem that we have nethness of, of these push forwards. So we, by taking K to be sufficiently large, we get that these are also Neff. And then finally, we can arrange uh, that this, okay, that this multiplication map is surjective. Okay, so we can arrange that. Uh, and then, so the way we ap apply the ample dilemma is, is, is we need a, you know, the starting point was a, was a, we need vector bundles. And so what we take is now, we take this, now to apply the ample dilemma, we take this to be W, right? This says rank, rank little W, we take this to be Q, it says rank little Q. And note that uh, this W here, this has structure group G equals PGL, the, the dimension of the sections of this K, K power of the canonical, which I was calling RFK. Right, it's coming from the sort of, the fact that this is, W is the symmetric product of something inside, whoops. And, and this, this part, yeah a structure group P, uh, PGL RFK. So therefore the whole thing also does. All right, so we're getting there. And now I'm just gonna claim, so what I need to verify in, the, in this ample this condition um, is if, if we look over, I have the nethness of W, but we, are, we already have that as because that, that was sort of the, uh, one of the hypotheses of theorem, of theorem one. Um, what we need to check is the second condition B that this map is is quasi finite, and I claim now that the, the induced map from MG bar to this Grassmannian is actually not just quasi finite but injective, right? And this is the map that takes this is the map that takes a curve C to SIMD to the multiplication map. Right, and, and because, you know, th yeah, these are identified, uh, like, yeah, if, if we look at this, this is embedded via the, it's kth canonical. What, what that tells you 
is what this tells you is that O of C of one is omega C tensor K. So these things are identified with, this is H zero of on the projective space of O of D, and this is H zero on C of O of D. And we know that the kernel, this is the point, we know the kernel determines C by, by a hypothesis. And that's, yeah, that's exactly what we need, that shows injectivity. Right, and now, uh, and now so just to, to wrap it up, you apply the ampleness lemma to, well, if you looked at the ampleness lemma, wait, here we, MG bars at the Lee Mumford stack, if you wanna apply it to a scheme or an algebraic space, you just, to make this work, you take a finite cover. I never, I didn't show this, but this is sort of an important property to Lee Mumford stacks, is that have, they have finite covers by schemes. Okay, a few more things I wanna say. I think I'm gonna go until one today. All right. So yeah, just to, to recap here, this is sort of the logical order of this entire argument. Um, we have the ampleness lemma here. Here we didn't say too much about the proof, but this to show this, um, you, the proof uses Nakai Moishizan here. And then we had theorem one. This is what we just proved. The proof used the ampleness lemma. And so what it really remains to show is the, sem is the nefness of, of these uh, vector bundles. So that's theorem, theorem two. But once you show theorem two, that this is this nefness hypothesis here, is what is input, you know, into theorem one. So theorems one, one and two together give you the projectivity of MG bar. So the last thing in the, in the last 10 minutes, I'd like to try to explain how you actually get a theorem two. And, I, and maybe I should emphasize that, you know, you can, so you can also get uh, by similar techniques, you can also get that MG and bar that the pointed case is projective. Okay, any any questions? So I'm gonna take, yeah, any questions? I mean, this argument is, is pretty neat. Although, they, yeah, there's, yeah, there's details involved. All right. So we need to show, I just rewrote the theorem that if you have, yeah, you have a stable family of curves over a, over a smooth projective curve. And we need to show nefness of these vector bundles. Okay, so the first reductions, which, yeah, which uh, takes, yeah, take work. But yeah, first reductions is that you can assume uh, that, that C is smooth and uh, a minimal surface. Um, and then also by sort of normalizing along the nodes and, you know, yeah, uh, you can, let's, yeah, assume that, yeah, the, uh, the family of curves is generically smooth. And then you can also sort of, by, by a, a base change trick, you can also arrange that the genus of T, T of the base curve is, is sufficiently large, at least two. But yeah, this is nice for us because it, it, since the fibers are at least genus two and the base is at least genus two, that you get that uh, the total family, the surface is general type. Okay, and there's one more reduction we need is, and this is interesting, we're gonna reduce to characteristic P. So what we're gonna do, but yeah. So we're gonna, we're gonna show that, um, but if you know the result in characteristic P for all primes, then you get it for, oops, then you get it in, in characteristic zero. So let's suppose that the base field is characteristic zero, and then what we'll, we'll, we do sort of a typical uh, spreading out argument 
where you know now your 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 family of curves C over T is defined over your field K, but everything in the picture is finite type, right? So there's only like finite number of constants that you need in your base field to define your entire family of curves. So in other words, by adjoining, you just adjoin all constants by adjoining all constants needed to define uh, C over T. Uh, you can get a finitely generated Z sub algebra and you get that the whole family of curves now lives over the spec A such that when you base change, you get your particular thing in, in characteristic zero. And then after enlarging uh, A, you can arrange for flatness, meaning that, you know, in this picture that this map is flat and this map is flat. Uh, and you can arrange that all fibers satisfy this, this, this condition star. Oh, and now, oh, so, and then, and then the point is that like, um, the close, the close points of spec A are positive characteristic where we're assuming we know the result and we know nefness is open in flat families, which then tells us that we get nefness uh, in characteristic zero. Basically, yeah. So the last, I have one more slide and that's the characteristic P argument. Uh, any any questions first? Okay, so last thing we, we need to show is as follows. So we're again, we're after this theorem two. It's what we're trying to show. And now we've made the following redu reductions. The, the key one being that the characteristic is now P. And yeah, and now the, yeah, this argument in characteristic P is gonna use sort of the, a non-trivial result in birational geometry and positive characteristic due to Ekedal. Uh, and that says that in characteristic P, actually, yeah, here we're, I, I'm, just to simplify things, I'm, I'm assuming P is not equal to two. This works with mild modifications when P is two. But in, yeah, in positive characteristic, if you have a smooth projective minimal surface of general type, which we've arranged, arranged C to be, uh, and an effective divisor uh, whose self-intersection is zero, then the conclusion is that you get vanishing of the first cohomology of, 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 uh, of that sheaf for n greater than or equal to two. So I'm not really gonna say anything about this result, but. But actually, th th this, is th this is the version that we're going to apply directly. The version of Ekedal is the statement that H1 of S, this is uh, of minus N is zero when N is at least one. So that, that yeah, and, and this is sort of a classical result in characteristic zero. This is Bombieri characteristic zero. And it's not hard to show that the Ekedal's result applies the, the version we wrote. Namely, like if you just look at the Serre dual, you're almost, you almost, the Serre dual of this version, because, you know, S is a surface, you get that H1 of S of omega S tensor N is zero when N is greater than or equal to two. So we're almost in the statement of uh, that we need in green, the only difference is we need the divisor and then you just play around with sort of this exact sequence. And use the fact that the self intersection is zero to in, in a, a junction to get the uh, to get vanishing. Okay.
All right, so now, yeah, here we are. Let's, let's sketch out the, the proof of theorem two. So let's suppose that this push forward is not an F. If the push forward is not an F, then there's a quotient that has a negative degree on T. Um, but okay, but here I just dualized M. So I, I've arranged that, yeah, M has positive degree. So M is positive, it's dual has negative degree. And here's the magic of characteristic P is that there's for, uh, a Frobenius map. The, the, so if you consider the, the Frobenius map up, uh, like applying both on, on the surface and on the base, uh, it has nice properties. First, the pullback of the, you know, by, by properties of the dualizing sheaf, you have sort of a nice expression of how Frobenius behaves. Um, but kind of to the point is that the degree of the pullback along the Frobenius of M increases by the degree increases by a factor of p. So by applying Frobenius repeatedly, you can arrange that the degree is, is as large as you want. And that's, that's so the, the, sort of the whole point. Um, and this allows you, so we can, we can arrange that m is as positive as we want. So we can arrange that m is in fact of the form of a, the, the dualizing sheaf on t to the kth power tensor something very ample. All right. I promise you I won't, I won't need much. Yeah, yeah, I just need one or two more minutes. And we also have, what, what else do we have here? We have, um, if you look, yeah, we have this rejection. I'll just rewrite. We have a rejection from pi push forward. To M dual, but now this has the form of omega t tensor k tensor L dual. And this map is subjective. So taking things to the other side, we get tensor omega t tensor k tensor L. We get a surjection onto O of t. And t is a curve that we've arranged to have genus at, at least two. Um, and this, so this has H1 greater than or equal to two, which implies that this, because the H2 vanishes, this also has gonna have an H1 greater than or equal to two. And then, uh, and then you, okay. So this is, we're almost there. And then you sort of use a Loray spectral sequence to relate these two things, to relate on one hand, H1 of what goes inside to relate this with, okay, no, no, not equal. Uh, let's just say, yeah, to H1 on the total family of omega C tensor K tensor the pullback of L. And, in, and you can arrange then that you, it, it, yeah, what you get is that this also, no, okay, you already, that this has also dimension greater than or equal to two. This isn't a hard, yeah, you just apply, you apply Lorex, the Lorex spectral sequence to the right sheaf, you sort of, this pops out. But this is, this is great because this push forward of L plays the role of D on the left-hand side. So we're gonna now apply this birational input. And what this tells us is that this H1 is supposed to be zero. So we get a contradiction. And we win. And what do we win? We win the projectivity of MG bar, right? And so that wraps up the, the course. And I wanted to say, uh, Thank you.